B'Shem Hashem Ne'asev Nasliach. Sorry about that, we got cut off, so we had to restart our um, uh, live video again. Um, the shiur is also dedicated for Le'ilu Nishmat Bolur Bat Le'am and dedicated for all of our singles that want to get married in the Zechut of Ezera, Shimshon, they should Bezrat Hashem find your Zivugim Bekarov Bizmano, Amen. And it's also, as always, in Le'ilu Nishmat uh, Zera Shimshon himself. And may his uh, promise and his zechut be a melitz for all of us and bring us yeshuot v'nechamot and men keni ratzon. So the Zerah Shimshon says in this week's parasha, he brings a midrash yalkuchim oni. That is the, the midrash that is on today's parasha and parashat emor. And he says the follows. This is the midrash. We'll quote the midrash and we'll talk about the midrash. It says in Midrash Yalkut Shim Onir, in the beginning of, the, of this week's parasha, on the, on the pasuk that says, Vayom Arashem el, Moshe, el Moshe, Hashem said to Moshe, Emor ala Kohanim bene Aharon. You shall tell the Kohanim, the sons of Aharon. Amar Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Yehoshua says, this is the Midrash, the Sikhnin Beshem Rabbi Oh Amar Rabbi Yushua the Sikhnin Beshem Rabbi Levi Rabbi Yushua the Sikhnin says in the name of Rabbi Levi Melamed this teaches Sheher Ah Hakadosh Baruch Hu LeMoshe Dar Hakadosh Baruch Hu showed Moshe Rabenu Dor Dor VeShofetav Generation after generation and its judges What does that mean? Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed in a vision to Moshe Rabbeinu every generation afterwards that will ever come and all of that generation's judges. Dor, Dor, Vedor, Shav, each generation and who's going to be the heads of the tribes, the Nesi'im and the leaders, the Chachamim, the Rabbanim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Moshe Rabbeinu everything. Meaning, before, after Moshe, before Moshe Rabbeinu was going to pass away, he wasn't going to miss out on anything. He is seeing everything that's going to happen in every generation. Imagine. Imagine like Moshe Rabbeinu saw, we already know like there's stories about how when he saw Rabbi Akiva, he saw Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he saw the Nisi'im, Rabbi, Rabbi Yudan Asi, until today's generation. Uh, he saw the Nisi'im, all the leaders, uh, Rav, Rav Steinemann, yeah, Rav Scheinberg, Rav Zatzal, Rav, Rav Ovadi Yosef Zatzal, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Rav Chaim... Uh, all of them. Vehera et Shaul, and he showed him also Shaul Hamelech, the first king of Bnei Israel, and his sons Uvanav, Shenoflim Acherev, and Moshe Rabbeinu saw that what happened to Shaul Hamelech, he fell in battle, and his sons, him, they fell in battle. Amar lo, he said to him. Meaning, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is interesting. Conversation between Hashem and Moshe, Rabbe, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and Hashem about the first king of Israel. He said to him, Ribbono Shel Olam, master of the universe. Is it really, is it ra'ui, is it befitting? Melech Rishon She'omed Al Banecha. The first king to ever rule on your children, Yidaker Bacherev, to fall by the enemy, to fall at the hands of the enemy and, and be killed at war. We never thought of it this way, right? But like it's in a sense like, it's like, a, I don't want to put a word on it, but it's, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. We had... One king we chose, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose for us, he's the first king of Am Yisrael, and, and, and what do we have to show for it? He got killed in battle. I mean, we're the chosen people, we're the chosen nation, right? We shouldn't have had any kings be killed. We're, we're, we're the ones that were taking out the word of Hashem. We're the real thing. We weren't just saying, hey, by the way, we're the chosen people, because God spoke to me, three days ago, and he said, we are. You know, that's not what happened. We knew that we're the real thing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows that we're the real thing. And he chose a king for us, the first king of Am Yisrael. So Moshe Rabbeinu has a very good point. Like you chose the first king of Am Yisrael, Shaul. I mean, come on. He had to fall in battle? Imagine him seeing this and he's thinking like, this is where it's going to go? 
We're going to go into the land of Eretz Yisrael. We're going to have judges. And then finally, we're going to have a stable king. And what happens to the king? He doesn't die of old age in his bed. He doesn't get to pass on the crown to his children. No. He's just going to get wiped out. Right? Obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu is not saying this for himself. He's saying he just doesn't look good for Am Yisrael. He doesn't look good for Hashem. For the first king to be killed. Amar la Kadosh Baruch Hu, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu. For those that do not speak non-Hebrew, Veli Ata Omer, he says, "You're telling me." Shem says, "You're you're 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 asking me this. You have a uh, you're, This is your taina on me. Don't ask me." Emor el Kohanim. That's from the pasuk. Tell this to the Kohanim. That's the first pasuk of this parasha. Emor ala Kohanim bene Aharon. Tell the Kohanim. Which Kohanim? Listen to what the Midrash says. It brings shivers to your spine. Eta Kohanim sheharag Shaul. The, those Kohanim that Shaul HaMelech killed in the city of Nov. Those are the ones that are being megatreg for Shaul. Those are the ones that pass judgment, so to speak, for Shaul HaMelech, for him to be killed. And this you see in the Pasuk that says, Vayomer Hashem ben Moshe, Emor ala Kohanim bene Aharon. Tell to the Kohanim, the children of Aharon. So to speak, Shakadosh Baruch Hu is saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, ask this to the Kohanim, the sons of Aharon. Don't ask me this question. Don't have this problem with me. It's not me. Who you should ask why. You want to know why Shaul, the first king? I, I, I feel the same way. You're right. The first king of Am Yisrael should not have fallen in battle. It's shameful. It's embarrassing for our nation. But don't ask me. Ask all the Kohanim that he killed in the city of Nov. They were the ones who were Megatrek. They were the ones who passed judgment on him that he has to get killed. Now, obviously, this Midrash is very wondrous. It's tamwa. It's, you know, what does this Midrash mean? What, what, does have to do, what does one have to do with anything? Right? Why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu only picked this one to ask about? And what is he asking? He says, he, He's asking because Shaul was the first king of Israel and he was killed at war. It seems from his question, if he was the second king of Israel, not the first king of Israel, or the third one, or... If he had died in another way, if he, had, if he had not died or gotten killed in battle, ba- battle, this would not have been a question for Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? So therefore, he's asking, like, your, Moshe Rabbeinu's question, it seems to be, it's a problem because he's the first king. If it was the second king, okay, fine. Or the fact that he fell in battle. If he hadn't fallen in battle, maybe they had poisoned him or something, would have been okay. If he wasn't in battle, it would have been okay. What's, what's, what's the deal here? It should have been, that it should have just been hard for Moshe Rabbeinu to understand why is it that the first king of Israel should be killed in any way, or die in any way. Meaning he should have just died in old, you know, old age. Why did he have to be killed in any way? Ve'od, and more so. Mahu megatregim oto. What does it mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know, these Kohanim are megatreg for him. They're ca- they were the ones who passed judgment. Those are the ones that, that caused the problem to make it so that he had to be killed. Ve'chi afil lo hayu megatregim oto. Lo haya lo one shachet sha'aragam? It's a good question also. He says, so you're telling me so when HaKadosh Baruch Hu answers Moshe Rabbeinu, you're telling me if it wasn't for the Kohanim causing a problem for Shaul HaMelech in the heavens, Shaul HaMelech wouldn't have been punished for the sin of killing the city of Kohanim? It's as if Moshe Rabbeinu is answering, uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is answering Moshe Rabbeinu telling him, you know why he's punished? Because the Kohanim that he killed are the ones that were like being 
the, what's the word? Um, um, the prosecutors. They're the ones who are prosecuting him, that's why. Oh, oh if, if the Quranim were not being, uh, if they were not prosecutors, then Shaul wouldn't be punished anyway for the sin that he did. He killed an entire city of Quranim, innocent people. He wouldn't have been punished for it. So it's as if Hashem is answering Moshe Rabbeinu and telling him, yeah, if it wasn't for the Quranim, yeah, you're right. You're right, he shouldn't have been killed in battle, but it's because of the Quranim that he killed. It's, it's just weighing on him. So if it wasn't because of the Quranim weighing on him, he still killed Quranim. He should have been punished for it, right? Clear so far? Hmm. Yes? The question is a little more general, but why does Moshe, hey, why, why did Moshe question Hashem? Like, couldn't, couldn't the answer to this be like when, uh, when uh, back to that Marshall goes, when Rabbi Akiva, they wrote all his words, and, like his destiny is being combed, and Hashem answered, he said, if you want me to answer this, I have to go back to Tov. Yeah, yeah. The angels so, asked that question, right? So, why is it that, like, I mean, there's so many questions you can ask. Yes, I think, I think part of Part of what the Zerah Shemishon is bringing out also is that, I mean, what was this that caught Moshe Rabbeinu's eye and what's the question and answer that's the back and forth between Moshe Rabbeinu and Kaddish Baruch Hu? What is this, really? Because like when Abraham said, but my, the, any question? Abraham Avinu, yes, then we have the whole situation of the Galut because of it and so on and right, so, so forth. So like, you would think, what, does Moshe get a punishment for questioning Hashem over here? No, I don't think Moshe Rabbeinu in this sense is questioning Hashem. He wants to know why. He's not saying like, how could you do this, right? It's more like, why? Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of disrespectful to you, kind of. He's saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this is kind of like a Chilul Hashem, your first king getting killed in battle doesn't look good on you. Like, why? That's why Hashem's answer is what? <laughs> Don't ask me, I agree with you, you know. But there was a problem, these Kwanim wouldn't let go, right? They, they had a thing on him. So he says, to begin the answer, Bring an introduction. The Mafarashim say, and it's brought down also in Asarama Amarot, Shaul, the fact that Shaul HaMelech merited that he came from the Shevet Binyamin and he became the king of Israel anyway. Because why? It was, it was truly a zechut for Shaul HaMelech to be the king, especially the first king. Because kings are supposed to come from Shevet Yehuda from the tribe of Judah. So, Shaul HaMelech really had big merit to be the first king of Am Yisrael and not being from Judah, being from Binyamin. So what was this Zachut? What power did he hold that he was able to be the first king of Am Yisrael from Shevet Binyamin and not Yehuda, from the other Shevatim? What, what did he have that the other Shevatim didn't have? What did he have more even than more than Shevet Yehuda, that he was able to be the first king of Am Yisrael. Mishum shekol ha-shevatim hishtachavu livne Esav im Yaakov avihem. Listen to this. He wasn't there when they met Esav. Right. It says, because all of the Shevatim bowed down to Esav. When Yaakov Avinu met Esav, after 22 years, all of them bowed down. The only one that didn't bow down to Esav was... Binyamin. Binyamin never bowed down because he wasn't born yet. Right? He never bowed down to Esav. It, it helps. Fact of the matter is, even though he didn't choose not to bow down, he still didn't have that defect, so to speak, because he never bowed down. He was not born. He wasn't there. Right? He doesn't have that. Not, we're not saying that's a sin. You'll see what it is. <clears throat> <laughs> because when the children of Yaakov, the other children of Yaakov, bowed down to Esav, they gave power to the Sitra Akhra. The Sitra Akhra is the negative forces, for a lack of a better term, and will not go further than that. The negative forces, right? When the other Shevatim bowed down to Esav, Esav being the head of the negative forces, they kind of contributed and they gave power to that force. What is what? What is that force? A negative force. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. It's basically the force, the energy source of the Satan. 
The sitra akhra is the satan, the yitzhar hara. Ma she'enken bin yamin, however, bin yamin that was never born at the time, he never gave power. He never, he never had an opportunity to become an underhand to the sitra akhra. Lekach zakha she'atza sha'ul mimenu. Therefore, yet there's a chut that Shaul came from him. Shaya melech harishol amalchei Yisrael. So that he'll be the first nation, the first king of Am Yisrael. Now this doesn't go further than this here, because it's not needed for our conversation, but just to tell you what this really means, it's a very powerful statement. That's why Shaul HaMelech, as the first king, he was tasked with getting rid of Amalek, destroying Amalek. Other kings yet were not, even afterwards. Why? Because he was the only one that truly had the power to destroy Amalek that came from Esav. Because he never paid any tribute to Esav. He never gave it power. He had all the upper hand. He never gave a single amount of the upper hand, so to speak, to Esav. So he was the only capable person to destroy the remainder of Esav, which was Yaakov's enemy. That was Shaul. Right? Bin Yamin Shevet was that, was that Shevet that was capable of doing it. <coughs> Therefore, later on, we always had problems. Until we got to, right after Bayit Rishon, right after first Beit HaMikdash, once again we see who gets rid of the ancestor of Amalek? Mordechai. Mordechai. Right? You're always right. Mordechai. Why? Because Mordechai was also from, according to the Gemara, there's discussions, right? But at least half. From Shevet bin Yamin. One half of him. Huh? And also, right. Because he was from that half, that's one of the Kabbalistic understandings. Why is it that Mordechai was the only one that felt he doesn't need to bow down? Because he knew, I always have the upper hand. I don't need to give in even a little bit. I don't have to look for... A, a loophole to say, oh, Sakarat the Fashot, he is like the king. If you don't bow down, he might kill everybody. He said, not me. I'm from Shevet bin Yamin. I don't owe him nothing. In fact, even if I kill him right now, right here, no one's going to do anything. Because I own him. And he literally did. If you go through the Midrashim of between what, what went on between Mordechai and, and Haman, he actually owed, owned Haman as a slave. He had the upper hand through and through. right? And that's why once again, Bnei Israel were saved from the hands of Amalek by someone from Shevet bin Yamin. Right? <laughs> nah. Nah. So that's one introduction. Okay? First introduction was that Shaul was from Shevet bin Yamin that never bowed down to Esav. Therefore, he never gave koach, he never gave power to the Sitra Akhra. And he, therefore, he was the only one that was able to become the first king. He had that zechut. Even though the first kings had to always be from Yehuda, and that's how it was afterwards. Right? But we see here that he was truly chosen to be the first king because Hashem chose him. Shavun Navi chose Shaul as the first king. And as we said before in our other shiurim, Shaul HaMelech was an extremely righteous king. Extremely. Too righteous, some say. Let's put it that way. Okay. He was too big of a tzaddik. He was an incredible person. Incredible. Anyway. Ba'od. So now, it says, now furthermore, furthermore, everyone is, uh, this is clear for everyone? Yes. Uh, so in theory, if Shaul would have never messed up, then the lineage would have continued through him, and it would have always went through Binyamin. Would... No, it wouldn't always, it's a very good question. So if he would not have ever messed up, uh -huh. right? It's Obviously, not this... This is deeper for the mess up. Yonatan was that. killed also. Right, Yonatan was killed also, even though he was also very, very righteous. However, it's not to say that um, it would stay in his lineage forever, right? But some would say that Yehonatan would also have a chance at kingship, right? But then again, it would still be transferred to Yehuda because that is the law in the Torah. But at least Bin Yamin would have the chance to be the first king to clear the slate with Amalek, which Hashem had ordered in the Torah, to start 
to, like, to literally start the settlement of Am Yisrael and tranquility for Am Yisrael, which we haven't seen for over 2,000 years because of Amalek. Okay? Everything we've gone through is because of Amalek. Right? Uh, uh, Holocaust. Holocaust. I mean, if, uh, if, if you research it, you'll see. It was totally, it was totally like a, a frame by frame of Amalekite plans. And, and this time they were successful. I'm sure you guys have, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this already. You know, the, the, um, um, the Nuremberg trials and, and uh, 11 people that were being hanged and so on and so forth. And the last one he gets up and he says right by the noose and he says, Purim Fest 1946, right before he's hanged. And so it, you see in the Megillah also that the dates are there. It's, it's, it's crazy. Mamash, it was, it was Amalek acting. So, next, Ve'ot. Deita bezohar parashat balak daf guf tzadik bet. In the Zohar it says, see, see, once again, when you go home, you could say, when people ask you, what class do you take with Rabbi Sakai? Now you could say, I study Kabbalah. <laughs> but you have to say it like that, okay? And then when you graduate, you're going to get the highest honors. You will, you will be given, bli neder, a red string, each one of you. So you will be known as Kabbalists. Okay? These are all jokes, people. I don't want people to be like messaging me like, could I get a red string? Ve'od. So it's brought down in the Zohar, Parashat Balag. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to give the Torah, this is a very famous Zohar. When Hashem came to give the um, Torah to the world, Ba'el Saro Shel Esav. He came to the ministering angel or the Sar. The Sar is the, the head, the leader, the spiritual leader of Esav, and asked him, Do you want the Torah? And he said, The Sar Shel Esav says, Ribono Shel Olam, the master of the universe. Hello, Ketiv Bah, doesn't it say in it, Lo Tirzah, do not kill? But you have to see, Zohi Birkati, killing is my bread and butter. That's what I do, right? It, it, it is a blessing that I have in the Torah. Why? Because when Yitzchak Avinu blessed Esav, he says to him, You shall live by your sword. So the Sarshel Esav turns to Hashem and says, Listen, it's a bracha that we have from Yitzchak Avinu. We live by the sword. So, um, please don't give us the Torah. Because if you give us the Torah, it says, Thou shalt not kill. We, we, how do we live? That's our livelihood. Now, obviously, it was an excuse. Right? But, you know, Rav Zev Lef put it very well. He said, because if they really wanted the Torah, they could have understood that when, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu, or when Yitzchak Avinu blessed him, with you shall live by the sword, they could have literally lived by the sword because Esav's nation was meant to be mercenaries for war. They would be hired for war. If you're being hired at war and you're fighting a war, you're not a murderer. Right? You're a warrior. At war, you're a warrior. And that, if that's the blessing they wanted to hang on to, that would have been okay. But, Oh, they were Amalek. That's my point. So... Right. So it's a... Yeah, okay. Don't confuse yourself. Go to sleep. So, <laughs> she didn't even hear me. What? So... So he says to him... So he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, Don't give me the Torah. So, so to speak, Hashem says, so, okay, you don't want the Torah, who am I going to give the Torah to? Ela ten ota, give the Torah lezar o shel Yaakov. Give it to the children of Yaakov Avinu. Amar la Kodesh Baruch Hu, Hashem said to Sar Shel Esav, Tell me etza ech afate zar o shel Yaakov. 
give me a way to convince the children of Yaakov to actually accept the Torah. How do I give them the Torah? Obviously, don't take any of this literally. Right? This is a Zohar, much of which we do not understand. This is what it says. And it's also brought down in Midrashim as well. Tell me a way that I could convince Bnei Yaakov to take the Torah. How do I do it? Amar lo. So he said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Esav said to Hash, uh, Sar Shel Esav, the head of Esav said, Ten lahem, give to Bnei Yaakov, Chelek Echad Misheli Lematana. Give them a portion from me as a gift. Give them a portion of what I have as a gift to them. It's something they don't have, take from me and give to them. So that they should also have a little bit of living by the sword. That's Esav's portion, so to speak, living by the sword. So Esav says, take a portion of living by your sword. Take that, a little bit of that portion from me and give it to the children of Yaakov Avinu. So that they shall have permission to pass judgment on um, um, like their court should have permission to pass judgment on like death penalties. Right? So here's Esav telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, take a part of my portion, which is killing. Okay? Give a little part of that, just a little part to Bnei Israel. That part will only enable them to kill when they have the right to kill. Which is what? Through a court system. If a person is being punished through the death penalty in the right way, then they'll do it. The rest of it is mine. All the illegal killing is mine. Just take a little portion, the legal part, and give it to them. All the murderous killing will still be mine. Right? You just give them that. You mean the murderous killing that were unsolved mysteries? No, no, no. Wait. De'i lavhachi, because if you don't say this, if not for this, that Bnei Israel should accept or be given part of this portion that I have to them, to give them permission to judge cases of, like, uh, with death penalty. Bnei Israel would not be allowed or be able to use the sword ever. They would not be allowed. They would have no rights to swords and wars and nothing. They wouldn't have a right to it. Even for a mitzvah. This is what it says in the Zohar. Which means we wouldn't even have permission to go to war in a war of Rashut, like choosing to go to war with neighboring countries that we felt are antagonizing us or whatever. We wouldn't have that portion. Therefore, we wouldn't be the kind of people that would ever be able to succeed in such ways because it would not be a part of our makeup. If you're able to ever be, if you're supposed to be able ever be successful in something, it has to be, some of it has to be in you. Some of it has to be a part of you. Bnei Israel, according to the Zohar, until this point, did not have this portion within them to be able to kill. To be able to live by sword. Okay, I know this is, a, this is deep. This is deep stuff, alright? It's got to be taken with a little grain of salt. But it's just for the, for the, for the point we're trying to make. So that's the second part of the introduction. So he says, we learn from here. We learn that Shaul had the merit to become the first king. Because Binyamin, his forefather, did not bow down to Esav, as we said. And Israel and Bnei Israel used the sword to use it to kill someone that is chayav mita, that is judged by the court to be, to, 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 as, how do you say? Like, he, to, to be judged to receive the death penalty. By the way, like what, what? No, no, no. Uh, uh, chayav also means obligation, but chayav in terms of Guilt means that the person is guilty, right? Which would mean that Bnei Israel got the rights, the permission to pass the death penalty on someone that is obligated for the death penalty. 
deserves death penalty. Now, in order for us to understand what the death penalty in Judaism is, just an introduction, point blank. The Gemara says, in the court system, in the Jewish world, in the Jewish, I mean, during the Beit HaMikdash, we don't have that today. But in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, when we had a court, real court of judges, and we were allowed to pass the death penalty, if, the Gemara says, if a court would pass the death penalty once in 70 years, it would be called a murderous court. There's an opinion that says once in seven years it would be called a murderous court, court, but both are very long, which meant the Jewish court would do everything in its power not to pass the death penalty, not to judge the death penalty on anybody. They would look for ways, look for any loophole to say that maybe he killed, maybe he didn't, but we don't have enough evidence. We leave it to God's hands. And a lot of times what would happen is, if the guy was really a murderer, he'd probably get hit by a carriage or something and get killed anyway, right? It's just that the court was too afraid to pass that judgment. They had the obligation to go through the system, judge the person, you know, interview the, the adim, the witnesses, do all the things that pertains to a, to a um, case of nefashot, between life and death, and then at the end decide whether they have the right to kill this person or not. Most of the time they would try everything possible to make it so that they don't get left with actually having to pass the death penalty. To actually judge someone for, for the death penalty. You understand? So when we say the Torah believes in the death penalty, many people are like, oh, Judaism believes in death penalty. You don't know what death penalty is until you actually study what death penalty according to the Torah is. The death penalty according to the Torah was almost impossible. Impossible to give out. Like right. But it was almost impossible to actually give it to somebody. I'll tell you, I'll, because you asked. Say someone broke Shabbat, right? According to the Torah, two people have to be there watching him breaking Shabbat. And they have to both at the same time warn him and say, hey, 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 we're watching you break Shabbat. By the way, did you know that breaking Shabbat has the death penalty? And he has to turn to them and say, yes, I know you're watching and I know that the, the sentence, I'm still going to do it. That's just one of the steps involved in actually giving him the death penalty. Everything else then, then taking the two witnesses into separate rooms and literally grilling them. Right? So it was very, very rare that the Jewish court would ever pass the death penalty. Do we have the numbers on how many? No, we don't have the numbers. However, the death penalty stopped when? When there was too many people breaking things that had the death penalty. So the Chachamim said, what is this? We're going to go after everyone to kill. Obviously, we can't do it anymore. So they, the court had to stop it. Because that's how Judaism was long, long, thousands of years ago. I don't remember if it was before, uh, before the destruction of the first temple or the second temple. But it was when things were going bad that the Chachamim said, listen, if we're going to do it, we're going to have to kill a lot of people. And it's not, this is not what Hashem wants. Meaning, if things have gotten so bad, something's wrong. Right? W meaning, they felt, we're also doing something wrong that's making people go so astray to have to kill and do things that have the death penalty. So we're going to come and judge them? That's how Judaism works. The punishment, the death penalty wasn't given to just punish. Right? Out of spite. Like, oh, you did it? Now I'm going to kill you. No. It was meant to amends. It was meant to fix. When they felt that it's no longer fixing anything, it's just getting rid of people, then it's, there's no sense in doing it anymore. Right? Now, once again, now, so he says, we learn that Shaul HaMelech merited to be the first king of Bnei Israel because Binyamin, his forefather, never bowed down to Esav. Number two, and Bnei Israel use the sword, meaning to kill. They have the power to kill. al only according to the Torah and according to the the, the system that we have in the Torah Why? Because of the gift Quote unquote That Esav gave them 
What was that gift? He said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem, you want him to accept the Torah? Take a portion of my gift, which is the sword, give it to them, so they'll be able to legally kill if needed. Why is Yachov Yavash? He's so angry. <laughs> so much anger. It's all that rap music, I tell you. <laughs> no, wait. So we're going to go, go into it now. Ve'alzeh. And therefore, so I'm, I'm glad you're following. So everyone's following? Okay? At least those were, that were here earlier on. Yes? Okay. Tell me what I said, but I'm kidding. <laughs> I hated that when I was in class and one of my rebellion where my teachers would be like, eh, uh, uh, it's Chak. And I'm like, what? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, what? <laughs> you know? Tell me what I said. Oh, I hated that. Because I was almost always wrong. You know? Ve'alzeh. And because of this, Moshe, because of this, it was difficult for Moshe Rabbeinu. Now we want to see Moshe Rabbeinu's original to, question to Hashem. Hashem, how could it be that the first king of Am Yisrael that you chose should get killed by the sword? What was really Moshe Rabbeinu having a difficulty with? He says, he said, how could it be? Shemi Shaya Melech Harishon, the person that was the first king of Am Yisrael, and he became the king of Am Yisrael He became the king of Israel because Binyamin, his forefather, did not bow down to Esav. Hashem, you made Shaul the king because his forefather never bowed down to Esav. But how could it be that the same person that comes from the grand great-grandfather that never bowed down to Esav he should fall by the sword, al pelishtim, by the hands of the pelishtim. It was meant. It should have been that they should never have been able. It should have been that they should have never been able to kill him. Why? Because he had this gift from Esav of the sword. Because Esav gave this gift to Israel. And that gift should go to Shaul more than anybody else. Because he never even bowed down to Esav. So not only did he not give anything to Esav, he took something from him too. He should have been the most powerful person against the enemies. How could it be that he fell in battle by the Pelishtim? Not even the Amalekites, not even the strong ones. Moshe Rabbeinu's problem was, okay, so Bnei Israel took some power from Esav, and they gave him some power because we bowed down to him. Well, hold on a second. One of Bnei Israel, Binyamin, never bowed down to Esav. So he never gave anything in, and he took two. How could he have fallen at the sword? He should have been invincible at war. Invincible. He should have been the guy who... Went to all the wars, came back without a scratch. He should have been Shimshon times 30. Vakadosh Baruchu. One second. Ba'kadosh Baruch Hu eshiv lo. Ba'kadosh Baruch Hu answered Moshe Rabbeinu, "Emor el Hakohanim, don't tell me. Tell it to the Kohanim of the city of Nov that Shaul killed. Shemegat regimoto, because those are the ones who have become the prosecutors for him. What did he mean by this? He said, "Hinehu, this Shaul haMelech beharigatam, when he killed all of these Kohanim, did he kill them according to judgment?" Did he kill them according to the Beddin? Did he were they were they deserving of the death penalty? Did he pass judgment on them? Or did he go straight out to the city and just wipe them all out? He wiped them all out. There was no din. We said, what did 
What did Esav give to Bnei Israel? He gave part of his portion to be able to kill. But what part of the portion was that that he gave? It was the legal portion, so to speak. Meaning, the Jews would be able to kill only when it's needed. When it's prescribed by the court, by the Chachamim. Not when you want, that's Esav. That's not Bnei Israel. So when you kill for no reason, illegally, whose power are you using? Esav. So he says that's why the Kohanim are the ones who are the prosecutors. Shaul no longer had the power of not bowing down to Esav and not taking anything from him. Now he did take something from him. You know what he took from him? He became a murderer. When he killed the Kohanim of the city, he signed his own future away. If there was any bedding that said they deserve to be killed, he had done nothing wrong and he hadn't given anything to Esav. But what did he do though? He gave in to Esav. He used the sword, the gift of Esav, not the way it was intended to be used. Illegally, not according to the Torah. So he says, by doing that, Venatan koach lesitra achra. He gave power to the negative forces. When he gave power to the negative forces, they were able to take over him. And when they were able to take over him, he signed his life away. Ve'im tomar. She says, now if you, if you want to ask, listen to how far he goes. He says, if you want to ask, why do you prosecute him? Why don't you use the other side? Why don't you use the power of the fact that he never bowed down, Benjamin never bowed down to Esav, use that as a powering force for him, and don't use the negative of the fact that he killed, like Esav. And, and, and don't say that the Kohanim prosecuted him. So he answers, he says, even that, you can't answer. Why? That's why it says, Sha Kohanim Shaharag, that's why the Zohar says, the Kohanim that he killed, Mekatregim Oto. They were prosecuting him. Meaning what? Once he took himself out, separated himself from his ancestors who never bowed down to Esav, he was left alone. Meaning what? The Zechut of not bowing down to Esav was Binyamin Zechut. His forefathers have that zakhut. Once he used the sword for the wrong reason, then he kind of became a lone soldier on his own. He no longer could use that zakhut. Now he gave in to Esav. And because of that, the Kohanim were able to prosecute him. And therefore, what happened? It became a midah, can I get midah? Because he killed the city of Kohanim, the Kohanim in heaven, so to speak, had a ta'ana on him. The Kohanim were prosecuting him in heaven. They were saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so to speak, how could it be that he wiped out an entire city of, of Kohanim? Innocent people, all innocent, and he's going to just die in his bed because he didn't bow down to Asav? That doesn't stand for him anymore. He gave that up when he killed an entire city. That zakhut is his father's. He doesn't have that zakhut. That's why the Zohar says, Mekatregim oto. They only prosecuted him. It had nothing to do with the forefathers. Binyamin still has that zakhut. Binyamin still has the zakhut of not bowing down. They still have that power. However, Shaul lost it because he gave it away. And again, every time I speak about Shaul HaMelech in, in, in Shi'urim, I feel it needs to be said over and over that we should never shalom, see Shaul in a negative light. Mistake? Yes, the Tanakh says that it was a mistake and he paid for the mistake that he made with his life. 
But that's not to say, Shaul HaMelech, the first king, the first king of Am Yisrael, somebody that Shemuel Anavi cried for, cried for, he ripped his garments for him, because he knew what a righteous king he was. Somebody that at the end of his life, <clears throat> before going to war with the Pelishtim, he, 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 he went to a sorcerer, and, and, and um, what do you call it? It was like a like a, He made a si- seance, seance. seance. He made a seance and he brought back the neshama of Shemuel Hanavi. And what does Shemuel Hanavi say to Shaul HaMelech? He doesn't say he's going to die. He, said, Why'd you do this? he says to him, tomorrow him and his son are going to be with him. What did Shaul HaMelech do? What would anybody do? Not go to war? He went to war happy. The Chachamim say he went happy. Why? He said Shemuel HaNavi has told him he's going to be with him. You know what that means? He's going to Olam Abba. Where is Shemuel HaNavi? He's in Olam Abba. Shaul HaMelech was worried that he's lost his Olam Abba. <laughs> Done. It was driving him crazy. Because he didn't want to lose his Olam Abba. He was extremely righteous. So when he found out that he's going to pay with his life, he was happy about it. He'd rather pay with his life so that he'll have his Olam Abba. So what, would, what would the bad news be? <clears throat> that was good news, but what kind of bad news would you The bad to? news was for Am Yisrael, for the Jewish nation. The bad news was that we lost, a, we lost our king because of the mistakes that we made because of the mistakes that he made, he so on and so forth. But he, but he was happy because he was, he was, so to speak, paying for those mistakes in the worst way possible, but for him, he was happy about it. Why? Yeah. So does the lineage that uh, received the power from Benjamin end with Shaul? Uh, what lineage? Meaning the fact that the source of power? No, it does. that's what he's saying here. It doesn't end with Shaul. Shaul ended it for himself, Right? But he's saying there's a chut avot that, that, that power still stays. That power still stays. You know, when you go to war, the one thing that can happen is that you could die in the war. Right? That's the one thing you fear. God forbid, so yeah. If that's the one thing he was excited for, then there'd be no point to go to the seance because otherwise you just fight your hardest and try to die anyway. You know what I mean? Like, if you find out that you're going to die in the war and that's what you wanted to know, then you just go to war anyway and try to die. It's not hard to die in war. No, but that's not what he did though. He fought with all of his might to the last second. You have to sto- read yeah, the story. You do, you read the story. Yeah. Read the story. It'll be more clear. Yes? Two questions. One, why did he kill that city of Kohanim again? And two, I'll never understand why you want to tell to die. Okay. Uh, we'll end it here and we'll take questions afterwards. Baruch Adonai le'olam, amen ve'amen.